Good morning, everyone. Today I'm joined by Sandra Calvert, professor in our Department of Psychology and director of the Children's Digital Media Center. She is also a faculty member at our McCourt School of Public Policy, and she's been a member of our community for almost 35 years. Sandy, thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. Let's jump right in. Your work spans the fields of psychology and linguistics, education and communications, and public policy. And your expertise is in the impact of information technologies on children's attention, comprehension, and social behavior. As we get started, could you share a little bit about the types of questions that have been most central to your work? I think the thing that excites me the most about my field of research is that there are always new questions to ask. That the field has changed so rapidly over the course of my lifetime with all the new technologies and the ways that things are being presented. But one thing that's made a constant impact are the, really the developmental needs of children. Those are a constant and they have always framed my questions. So questions about how can we optimize children's development? How can we educate them as we entertain them with, a, with technologies where you're not a captive audience, where you vote with your eyeballs and, or your hands and you can just leave? Um, how do social and cognitive development interface with one another? So how do our relationships with media characters then impact our learning. So I'm really excited about, you know, you know, friendships, you know, how we can cultivate friendships, how we can cultivate cognitive skills by playing a game like we, you know, which is an active video game. So the kinds of things that I am most fascinated about is how to improve the lives of children and families in our country and throughout the world. Well, thank you. In introductory comments, I mentioned that you're the director. You're also the co-founder of the Children's Digital Media Center. Tell us about the work of the center and the kinds of research, that, the types of research that you and your colleagues are contributing to. We began with a grant from the National Science Foundation. The Children's Digital Media Center was a consortium of universities and scholars in different places, Northwestern, University of California, Los Angeles, University of Texas. Over the years, some of that composition has changed, but it came from the vision of you know, people who saw, hey, what we could do is really use technology to improve children's lives. And the big question that we started off with had to do with this change that we were seeing between observational and interactive media. So what are the different affordances of watching versus interacting with media? And then how do, does our identity, how does who the kid is interface with what they take away? because people don't just come a blank slate. So that was one big question that was overarching across multiple centers, you know, multiple places that were part of the center. Then we moved into very early development. Could babies and toddlers learn from media, which was a hot controversial topic. The American Academy of Pediatrics banned it. And we were like, well, not so fast, you know, because Older kids watch with their younger siblings and some of these programs are educational. Is it impossible for them to learn? So we went after that question. We tackled obesity. I was on a National Academies panel and we were really trying to delve into the obesity issue. And one of the things that we thought about is that, that the characters and the marketing could also be used to get them to eat healthier. And so that was a driving direction of yet another grant. And then uh, we looked at having kids in low income neighborhoods who were overweight. And if we could get them to use the we, this was with Amanda Stiano, one of my uh, doctoral students who is flourishing now. Um, and we looked to see if we could get them to lose weight by playing in teams and if they cooperated with cop cooperated with each other, they lost weight. But if they competed as teams, their, their basic executive function skills increased. They got better at planning, I think because they had to figure out a way to win against the other <laughs> team. So now I am just fascinated, Jack, by just the characters themselves. 
the kinds of relationships that kids form with them and how they learn from them. So, you know, do they have close emotional relationships? And now they talk back to the characters in increasingly interactive ways. So that's that's where I am now. Oh, that's fantastic. Can you, can you share a little bit more about the kinds of programs that you're examining, the, the educational impact and the opportunities that come from these programs? You mentioned we. Are there others that you've explored? Well, Dora the Explorer is probably my favorite show of all time. I study Dora constantly and have become very good friends with the Dora people. So <laughs> they have been very generous to, to share their assets with us so that we could create programs. Evan Barba from CCT uh, helped design a, a program that we used that became one where the character, it was a prototype, so character, characters could interact with kids. So we used Dora, we also used Diego. So, uh, and I'd studied Dora in the past. So she's just one of my favorite all time characters. Uh, she's an adventurer and I just adore her. Uh, Sesame Street. Sesame Street is a wonderful program and it is the gold standard of children's media. Uh, one thing we do is we've taken the characters in the form of puppets and then we have used those puppets to teach kids things like how to seriate, which is sequence objects, which is an early math skill. Uh, and we've done that with Dora, you know, in a different way. Um, but we also took characters that kids didn't know and we built relationships with them. One is Dodo, who is this lovely character from Taiwan that I met when I was over there giving a series of talks. And Dodo, we familiarize kids with him by having parents and kids play with puppets and with other materials that were educational. And then we could see increases in kids learning when they had these close relationships. So I'm very fond of Dodo. And then Scout and Violet who are interactive toys uh, by Leapfrog, but we turn them into assets to use to create stories. There are wonderful, wonderful programs on PBS. And let me just say that it is one of the bedrocks of making great programming for kids in the United States. And, and for many of them, they co-produce with places throughout the world. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Now, as the pandemic began, our children had to transition to virtual learning, learning at home. In yes. most cases, this involved an increase in their interaction with technology. Last spring, you and your colleague, Rebecca Ryan, offered advice for teacher parents and call, and who were called on to supplement their children's education. Could you, could you reflect on the role of technology for children as we have navigated home learning? And are there lessons you see as students return to in-person and hybrid learning? I would say that the, the task that parents took on during this pandemic has been unprecedented. And my hat is off to every single one of them because this has been such a difficult time. Many of them also work outside the home in addition to inside the home. They've now become their children's teachers. Um, and I think all of us probably walk away with a new appreciation of our teachers about the central role that they serve in our children's development. So one thing that, that, and all of this is informal, there's not, you know, the research hasn't come out, although people are looking at it, but I have seen some, you know, kinds of uh, participant observations and people commenting, uh, commentaries, things like that. And some of them have argued that it created a normalized life, even though it was different, that their kids were still able to go to school. You know, this was in Australia, you know, and they were talking about we had all these fires, our kids could go to school, we could go to work, you know, that there was a kind of, of a, a way that technology was able to open up things for us, you know, like using FaceTime, like we are right now in Zoom. Well, actually, we're Zooming. So, you know, there were these, these affordances of technology that allowed us not to be so isolated. And yet I think that, you know, one thing that I foresaw in that interview uh, with Rebecca, and I just hats off to her, she's an amazing woman, I love her work, was that um, 
the characters in media could be used in apps to interact with kids in ways that would engage them and that would teach them, that would keep them focused and that they could learn even in the midst of a pandemic and that they could be a resource for parents. And I think that that has come to fruition. I think that that has happened. But what hasn't been able to happen to this point is, and we're starting to see it slowly come back online, are the close personal relationships that aren't mediated by a screen, of being with small children, of taking a small child's hand and walking with them, you know, to go somewhere or to show them something, that that personal touch is so essential in terms of making education exciting to children and also for everyone's mental health. You know, we are social beings. We are people who care about each other and that we do what we can in life to, to give that, that kind of care and concern and love to, the, to our students. And I think that that's one of the things that, that we still do through a screen, but it's not quite the same. In fact, I asked my students the other day, I said, do you think we, that you have a parasocial relationship with me? And, you know, which is like a on, kind of on screen sort of thing that's the sure. wrong way. And, you know, and they laughed and one of them, you know, a couple of them said, well, I actually have met you in person. I had you in another class before. <laughs> I said, well, that is true. But, you know, I'm really here. <laughs> we really are interacting. Oh. But um, I think the innovation of people is very impressive for me. I think parents have had some challenges trying to decide about how much screen time children should have. And I would say to them, just think about media as a diet, that you know, it's the quality of media that you want and don't be as concerned about the quantity at this moment and also take care of yourself, which I know is one of Rebecca's main points is that so many people are struggling. You know, when you look at oh, low income families, you know, who don't have the internet speed that other people have or have a lot of noise in the background, uh, that concerns me, you know, that the, they are at a bigger disadvantage than children who had more affordances. But all of our kids need that social scaffolding. We all need that human touch. Yeah, thank you. Now, both children's educational programming and technology have seen incredible change. Can yes. you reflect on some of the significant moments you've experienced in your career, the changes you've seen and where do you see the field going next? Well, let me just say, I was around when Sesame Street was born. <laughs> <laughs> and not a little kid, you know, I was like older when, when Sesame Street first emerged and I was so impressed with it. But, you know, the, the person who is the poster child for what I do is Fred Rogers, you know, who had, you know, par who looked right into the screen and told kids, I love you just the way you are who talked to kids, who engaged them, and who cared about them. And that I see is continuing. The, the educational programs now have moved, even the traditional ones, you know, from being ones where you just watch characters do things with each other to ones where the characters turn and address the audience and ask them questions. And the kids talk back. And that promotes learning. That is one of the things we've taken away from our research over the years is that engagement is really important. But now the characters can reply with social contingency. So with Dora, Dora would ask things like, what was your favorite part of the story? And children would respond and she would say, I like that part too. My favorite part was. And so it's a pseudo conversation that you have you know, this back and forth, and yet you can't really go after things that are more academic in nature, like a, that have an answer. And now with social contingency and prototypes that we've developed, you can have these social, socially contingent things so kids can learn math rules, for instance. Sure. So I see that emerging, you know, where it's personalized, where it's interactive, but the media characters united across all these different platforms and the parents and the teachers are essential in making it work optimally. It's not something you just put your child with, a screen or a character, it's where you work with them and you use it as your tool. 
Oh, thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough for taking this time to share your reflections with us. As, as we bring this conversation to a close, is there a message you'd like to share with our community? I think that our community is one of the most special communities I've ever had the good fortune to be part of. And, you know, I feel very blessed to have had, uh, you know, a career where I, where I could explore questions uh, that were of interest and continue to be of interest to me. I've always been that kind of inquisitive kid. And that's what I would like to instill for everyone, for our students at Georgetown and to parents and children alike is to keep that sense of curiosity alive and to explore and to wonder. And there are all kinds of exciting opportunities before you. Well, I can't, again, I can't thank you enough for sharing your perspectives and joining us in this conversation. And I'm grateful to you for your important scholarship and your many contributions to our Georgetown community. Thank you I, so much. And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya everywhere.